Hi, I'm Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to find more episodes of the show, as well as articles and information about my one-on-one alignment coaching, then you can head to my website. It's simonjedrew.com. If you do have the means to support the show, then I'd love to see you in my Patreon community. Just go to patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew, where you'll also get access to over 240 episodes recorded before 2020. But for now, enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome to the Practical Stoic Podcast. And today I've got a really wonderful repeat guest on the show, none other than Professor Scott Aiken. And uh, we have kind of an eclectic conversation. We thought that we were going to be talking about stoic logic, and then we ended up talking a lot about uh, an article that he wrote, which is just a wonderful article. Article. I'm going to put the links in the uh, show notes there. An article about Seneca on outdoing God. Really interesting stuff there. We, we talk about uh, different Hellenistic worldviews. We talk about virtue. Uh, all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, Scott is just such a wonderful person. He's always got a wise word to say and a kind word to say. So that's a really good combination there. But um, for those of you who, who don't know of Professor Scott Aiken, he's an American philosopher and an assistant professor of philosophy at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, where he also holds a joint appointment in classics. He's earned an MA in, uh, in, in philosophy from the University of Montana, I should say a master's, uh, in 1999, and a PhD in philosophy from Vanderbilt University in 2006. His principal areas of research are epistemology, argumentation, theory, uh, ancient philosophy, and pragmatism. And on top of all this, he's also the co-author of a book, Why We Argue how, and How We Should. Uh, so you can find a link to that book in the show notes. And without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Professor Scott Aiken. So Scott, um, I'm excited to have you here today. And um, and and look, we wanted to uh, start by discussing your paper that you recently uh, wrote uh, on Seneca outdoing God. And this was such an interesting thing for me to read because I've just been digging so deep into trying to figure out what the Stoics thought about God, uh, what they thought about thought about theology, and and Seneca, as you point out in this paper, believed that we could surpass God. Do you want to explain that a little bit? Yeah, that's a, so that's a, that's a surprising thesis. Um, And, um, and one that uh, seems to sort of bump up against a number of other standard sorts of thoughts, which is that it looks like then if stoicism drives you to this, it looks like stoicism has a kind of an unjustified hubris there. Mm -hmm. Uh, It looks like that risks a kind of impiety. Uh, stoicism it looks like it should be something that should put us on the road to a special kind of piety. That's a kind of, seems like a, sort of a deeply impious thought. It seems just metaphysically implausible for us to be able to vie with God. Um, and so, um, so in some ways, the one thought would just be, yeah, that's that's just bonkers. If Seneca's views um, and the Stoic and you might say sto- sort of Stoic central views lead you to the thought that in achieving wisdom, you surpass God, that looks like that's, um, in special academic speak, a reductio of your view. It's like that is, your views have led you to something so absurd, so impious, that that means that everything upstream from that is now, is, it shows that that's tainted. And so I think the stakes are high uh, with Seneca's surpassing God thesis. And, mm. um, and so being able to sort of think that through uh, and retrieve it from that sort of car wreck, <laughs> drive the train off the tracks, right? I mean, that is, that's a place where, and again, Stoicism sort of has a number of these paradoxa, hmm. where it looks like the Stoic says something bonkers, and the Stoic says, wait a minute, <laughs> we're going to think this through together, and you're going to see that despite the fact that that looked bonkers to you at the beginning, it actually looks totally reasonable and in fact is manifestly true once you've thought it through so you might call that the exercise the 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 exercise of stoic paradoxes Mm. um and so some familiar ones only the only the wise man is rich 
Mm. So only the sapiens is a rich is rich. Only the only the wise person is free. Uh, all who those all of those who are not wise are slaves. Um, and so those sorts of commitments, uh, that, that, uh, that virtue is sufficient for a good life, those are sort of, those are familiar Stoic paradoxes and Sen or, uh, Cicero covers them in Paradox of Stoic Orum. But the objective mm. with the Stoic paradoxes is that you say, okay, that sounds bonkers. Think it through. And in the process of thinking it through, you master something. You master yourself. You master certain kinds of reactions that you've internalized from the culture around you that's got its para uh, that it's got its priorities upside down and so on. That you work in sort of overcoming your natural reactions, or you might say your unnatural reactions, if stoicism is life and living in a court of nature. But you overcome certain kinds of habitual reactions, and you master yourself. In, uh, in in coming coming to terms with these paradoxes, the Stoics did this with ethics. They did it with logic. They were famous for a lot of paradoxes in logic. Mm. And so, what you do is, in thinking through the paradoxes, you master the thing that you might say need, that produced the paradox. Um, mm. So, and and again, in logic, a number of some of them are good, some of them are silly. I mean, so. Chrysippus spent a lot of time thinking about the liar paradox. Statements like that this is this statement is a lie or this statement is false. Um, mm. Have you, the thinking about that sort of uh, clarifies your thought about what meaning is and truth and falsity and things like that. Uh, statements like um, they had a the paradox of the horns. Uh, uh, if you haven't lost something, you still have it. I have not lost my horns, therefore I still have horns. Hmm. <laughs> wrap your that's, head around that one <laughs> that's it, right you're like I, I think the first premise is i think the first premise is false uh but so but again the crucial thing is being able to say okay i i ended up i ended up with something that looked crazy figure it out um so uh these are sort of exercises for the stoics ascases in some ways but they're ascases for the mind mm. um and so in this regard um uh, my take on seneca's uh statement about the sapiens, the, the wise person, surpasses God. And the Latin is unambiguous. Antiquedat Deo. Uh, goes past antecedents, go, stands before mm. uh, God. So the, the, it's not that this was just a bad translation. Uh, it happens in De Providentia, and it happens in one of his letters to Achilles. So mm. it's a consistent thing that shows up in Seneca. It's a... Um, and and it's and it's bonkers. And so, how do we get to it? Yeah, um, and so it's, that's in, a, it's so interesting because like it, like it makes sense, and <clears throat> it, it makes sense once you start to think about it. And I think that you're right. You know, this technique of using a paradox, it's absolutely brilliant because what it does is it catches you out, and you immediately say, "Oh, hang on, what's that? Oh, oh, you, you're not free. Oh, wait, wait, hang on. What does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be a slave?" Oh, okay. Is Facebook my master? Am I a slave to Facebook? <laughs> and then you realize that you are and you think, okay, wow. Like, yeah, okay. I'm not free. Only the wise are free. And then you look at Seneca talking about, and, and if I can kind of sum up the way that he thought about it and you can correct me if I got this wrong, but it's basically that because the gods or God is naturally good, naturally virtuous, gods or god doesn't actually have to work towards anything they're just that whereas the human being is so uh downtrodden by nature that we are just in these crazy bodies that want us to go this way or that way or this way or that way and and it actually takes a lot of effort for us to become wise to become free to become virtuous right that's exactly it so mm. uh and so it, and so it's not that we and so the crucial thing is in some ways, it's a comparison between our two natures. The gods couldn't be otherwise than perfect. Mm. They couldn't help but, gods so properly conceived can't help but be wise, can't help but be good, can't help but be knowing creatures. Uh, not even creatures, beings, right? Yeah. Creatures gets it wrong. Um, we, on the other hand, are not by nature wise. We are not, we are, we are by nature's things that desire to be wise. 
we are creatures that does by nature desire to know. We're creatures that in some ways are, are naturally inclined to be good, but that doesn't guarantee that any of those, um, mm. that we want those things by nature, that we want to get along with each other, that we want to know things, that we want to have a kind of virtue. Um, those are things that we are inclined towards, but there's nothing guaranteed by them. And so as a consequence, when we achieve them, that's an, a, that's a kind of achievement that the, that's, that's not possible for the gods. Hmm. That's not possible for the gods. And so the crucial thing is to see it less as us knowing more than the gods that won't ever happen. Uh, being more stably wise or uh, perfect or good than the gods. That's not going to be a thing that's going to be possible either. Uh, you're going to die. You can't know everything. Mm. Um, and so you are a finite being, but you do perfect yourself and you have these sort of moments of perfection. And in that regard, you draw equal to the gods in that, in that perfection. And that's again, like another kind of stoic, um, another stoic paradox that, um, that if good, if virtue is the only good and you achieve those virtues, then you have achieved the same virtue as the gods. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so in this regard, uh, because it's an achievement and I think that you rightly identify, it, which is that they get, they, uh, they get, they get the goods of virtue and they get the goods of knowledge by virtue of the things that they are. You, the wise person, gets those goods by virtue of a kind of work that we did are achieving these things as praiseworthy in a way that uh, the gods isn't. And in this regard, we do surpass the gods mm. whenever we have wisdom. And this is kind of making me think of, um, it's kind of making me think even of the kind of theology of the religion that I grew up with, which was Mormonism. And it's kind of like, you know, you have the angels in heaven um, I, I'm going to butcher this and I'm probably going to get like 20 Mormons emailing me saying you've got it all wrong <laughs> and, and get back to church. I'm not in a position out, to correct but, you here though. <laughs> but you know, you have the angels that, that come down to earth and inhabit bodies. And, okay. you know, obviously um, it, you have free will on earth, which is your ability to be tested and, you know, Hey, how strong are you? And then um, it's kind of an intermediary place on your eternal journey. Um, and, you know, I think that, that, I think that what Seneca says, says is, is kind of just reminding me of that because it's like, yeah, the gods don't have free will. They don't have anything other than just to be good. I mean, I mean, that's a pathology in all, all in itself. I couldn't imagine just always being good. It'd be horrifying. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's a good thought because it, it makes us realize that, Hey, like, okay, um, I have something to aim at. I have something to attain. And, and by attaining that and by aiming at it, I am becoming, you know, and, and you're right, it does, it can lead you to a massive ego trip. <laughs> um, but I think what's really important here, I'd love to discuss with you, because uh, I discussed this with everyone and people probably get sick of me saying this, but we obviously have to define like, what did Seneca talk about when he talked about God? What did he mean by the gods? Uh, what was the mythology of the time? What was the religion of the time? And how did he see yeah, let's start with that. What is God to Seneca? What is God to Seneca? And what's God to the Stoics? Um, mm. So in some ways we don't have, we have, so ironically enough, I mean, in, in some ways it's a sort of a drawback of, uh, of Latin, uh, which is that we don't have any articles. So is it that you do better than a God, right? That you have antiquated Deum, Right. But mm. it would be best if we had like a definite art, like a definite article, the God yeah. uh, or an indefinite article. You're just better than a God. Right. And it's like, maybe it was one of those, you know, middling gods, right? Like a God, the, like the, the, the God of pond slime or something like that. You do better than that guy, but not better than Zeus or something like that. So already we've kind of got like a little bit of a puzzle about like how, how to do this. Now, again, it's in, it's in the singular, um, we on our sort of Christianized uh, uh, appropriation of all this, whenever we see God in the singular, unless we're thinking that it's, you know, it's got one of those articles in front of it, we think of it as a proper name. 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, so even on our receiving end, there's a little bit of a weird kind of look of we got a distortion whenever we're reading, whenever we're reading Seneca here. Um, but we've got a little bit of some help, which is that, um, you know, we have some documents from the ancient period that can kind of clarify uh, at least Stoic doctrine about God. Um, again, we don't have a lot of information about Seneca's views there. Uh, we have, you know, it's some exchange, uh, which is probably apocryphal um, with, uh, with Paul, uh, which is not probably apocryphal, definitely apocryphal. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but beyond any of that, I mean, really pretty much all we've got is a couple of passing references to the divine uh, in Seneca about um, us sharing in the divine in our virtue. Uh, mm. And so in that regard, that's continuous with this thought. Um, but the, the big thought is just that uh, the sort of a, a continuous Stoic thought, which is that um, what's the divine? Well, uh, the divine is in some ways the sort of the reason of the world. Uh, and what's that? In some ways, someone could say, right, so physics, what's that? Uh, or we might even say uh, the, the, the history of the world and uh, Stoic physics thought that it was a big circle, that you have the echorosis at the end, uh, that everything kind of becomes fire and we sort of start it all over again. Mm. So there's a kind of an eternal return uh, and that everything that we do is in some ways a kind of a repeating. So every, every, um, every small quotidian decision that we make in some ways is a decision for eternity that mm. in some ways enlivens the world. Um, but yeah. uh, so, but we see from Cicero giving us a kind of a little catalog of uh, uh, Stoic theology in his On the Nature of the Gods. Um, in some ways, the God is sort of in the world, is of the world, is a sustainer of the world. Um, and the academic skeptics said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. That doesn't make any sense. That seems bonkers. That seems silly. The, the, the Epicureans thought, no, gods have to be physical things. They have to be distinct from the other things. Otherwise, we don't know what we're talking about whenever we talk about the god of the world. And the Stoics, in some ways, thought that there was a kind of a way to kind of be a kind of a... Um, uh, in, so uh, an, an entheist, that you think that everything is sort of in and of God. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a good deal of sort of cases where it looks like whenever the Stoics we're talking about the traditional Olympians or something like that. They talk about Zeus and Apollo and stuff like that. Um, but there's a real sense that they reinterpreted the traditional Olympianism as continuous with this, this more pan uh, uh notion of what, what the, what the gods are, what God ultimately is. Hmm. Now what, it, what is panentheism? Uh, that everything is in and of God. Um, yes. Okay. So, uh, right. So uh, it, it seems weird and maybe even a silly uh, attempt at sort of giving a name to a sort of a, a, a view, but at the very least, that's, that's one of the ways to kind of think about the, the, the Stoics. And, and it's continuous with a number of other kind of Stoic themes, which is fatalism, providentialism, uh, to think of the world as in some ways a manifestation of, a, of God's plan. Uh, and that's in fact, God enacting what that plan is mm. uh, that not thinking of them as separate things. Um, and so piety in some ways is part of being a natural creature. Um, mm. So, uh, so we see this in some ways, uh, Diogenes Laertius has got a little catalog of this uh, in outline uh, uh, the lives of the, Lives of the Philosophers, and we see this from his biography of Zeno. Um, and then mm. again, Cicero gives us a pretty good, a pretty good uh, picture of that in his On the Nature of the Gods. The problem is that by the time that we get to the, the imperial period, uh, we're seeing mostly ethical works from these folks. Um, and so, you know, you see, you see some pictures here and there in Epictetus and in, uh, and in Marcus, um, a little bit later than Seneca, um, some little glimpses of some theology here and there, but nothing really developed. 
Uh, and so, you know, in some ways it's a little bit of guesswork. In some ways it's a sort of, it's not hard to see them as continuous with this sort of more not thinking that naturalism and theology are two separate things. You. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well that, that's, that's a really good point. I think that it, nature and theology can and should go hand in hand. I mean, that's, that's just my opinion just because, I mean, if you're wanting to understand the works of whatever you call God, I mean, well, nature exists within that you and I exist within that. So if you look at us and nature and try to figure out the logos of nature, which you can definitely figure out, um, well, we can figure it out to a certain extent. Um, you know, it's a very interesting rabbit hole to go down, but yeah. So I actually, I, I really think that the way that the Stoics talked about God is very, very interesting. And it's almost as if, yeah, like that whole, you know, okay, well, it's a one well-ordered whole and you exist within the whole. So what is the thing that is making you exist and live? Well, just call it God, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's bigger than you. It controls you. It is you and it will crush you eventually. So <laughs> why not, why not be kind to it, you know, and, and, and act as if you can actually tap into that and figure out what would be good. And, but, but talking of logic, talking about different arguments, what would the academic st- skeptics have said to an argument like that? Yeah, great. Um, well, uh, for the most part, the academics um, responded to Stoic, specifically Stoic theology, with just incomprehension. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and so, um, one of them was that it was a lot of doublespeak. Um, uh, uh, thinking so, in some ways, a, a, a not unreasonable thought, which is to which is that um, uh, gods are distinct from their creations. Gods are distinct. If there's a dependence relation or something like that, then they've got to be numerically distinct. That's not a, that's not a, a, a it's not, it's not, it's not a silly thought. Mm, <laughs> um, mm. The other one is, uh, is that they, is that uh, it wasn't just the academics, but the Epicureans also just thought that this was just silliness. Um, that one, for one, the, 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 both the academics and the Epicureans just said, look, I mean, you've got this, you've got this physics that, has a, that looks like it's kind of a sometimes it looks like it's Heracliteian, sometimes it looks like you're committed to there being discrete substances. Uh, it's not entirely clear how, how all this is supposed to work. What evidence do you have to for this ecperosis at the end of it all that's in a cycle? Where, where exactly what's what's the evidence for that? Like that, that's mm. it's a nice story, but um, and then uh, but specifically to the notion of the gods, um, the Epicureans. Uh, would often say, yeah, this is equivalent to atheism. Like, I don't see what, I, like, I, you call it God, I, like, that just sounds like nature to me, pal. I don't know what you're talking yeah. about. Um, and that was an academic response, too. Um, mm. uh, the, the, the other one was that, um, again, the one thought was that, remember that we started off by saying, and we even kind of got the paradox by saying, look, the gods are supposed to be these sort of perfect kinds. Of, God is supposed to be a kind of a perfect thing. Um, and on Stoic, on the Stoic physic, physics account of creation of God, it's supposed to be this sort of big, perfect spinning circle or sphere, it's called multiple spheres inside. And why that? Well, because you look up and you see stars and stuff like that. So it looks mm. like you kind of got a big, spinning sphere and the uh the epicureans and the academics just thought that this was a very silly thing i mean they didn't think that it was false that the world was shaped this way they just thought it was like why is god like how exactly is as um cicero puts it uh how is a whirling tubby thing a perfection yeah <laughs> you've got a whirling tubby god stoics that doesn't sound that perfect to me. <laughs> um and so um you know, it looks like there are sorts of costs that come with uh, that come with Stoic theology. Um, there's a question for modern Stoics as to how central that theological comportment and that those theological commitments need to be for the ethics or for Stoic logic or for Stoic uh, Stoic um, theories of knowledge. Um, the Stoics themselves, the ancients, thought that it all came as a big package, kind of have to do it all at once, and it all kind of comes together as a big coherent system. Um, but to us these days, we're just like, look, you know, 
Stoic logic is pretty good. Stoic theory of knowledge, eh, it's pretty good. It's got some drawbacks. It's kind of kind of plus and minuses there. Stoic physics, not so great. Uh, Stoic theology, I'm, I'm not so sure what I think about that. Uh, yeah. Stoic ethics looks great. I mean, that's where that's that's where Stoicism sells. Uh, but all mm. the rest of the stuff, it looks like folks kind of go, yeah, you know what? I I'll take this physics. I'll take that uh, right. So there's a kind of a question as to like how cafeteria ish we can be with stoicism. Stoicism. Mm. The ancients probably would have said, you know, you gotta you gotta take it all, right? You gotta take it all. Um, but you know, I, I I'm I'm unsure whether or not that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think I think what's really interesting is uh, the kind of link between like the sage for example and and their view of what god is because if you say that well you know we are sparks of god and we have the divinity within us and the sparks of the whole um i mean which is true we are a part of the whole of everything because you there's no possible way to take us out of nature i mean you can throw us you know light years into the into the galaxy but we're still within the bounds of nature um and and then if you say okay well our job is to uh, like seneca said he said we have two things universal nature and our individual virtue that's it right so if you can learn from universal nature what it means to be a virtuous person then you can become like the sage and it almost seems to me like sa- the sage was almost like a jesus character for the stoics it's like he's the person who comes along and reaches that divine point where you can say, that's what I want to be, right? And you follow that. Um, what is the link between the sage, the gods, um, and, and the Stoics? So it's awesome. Uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, so on the one hand, it, it was a regular question. Um, mm. Stoicism asks a lot of us. Um, and so a couple of places, I mean, it's like, look, you, you start off with, the you know Epictetus's grand division between what's up to us and what isn't, and only caring about what's inside, inside what's up to us, and seeing that that's that like that seems that seems like almost too much to ask of us. Uh, the same thing goes with the Stoic theory of knowledge that the sage doesn't make errors, the sage does not err, the sage doesn't have false beliefs. It seems like that's just not something that we can do. Um, we get tricked all the time. Mm. Um, and so on the one hand, I think that this is correct. I think that the, whenever the Stoics, so this is my own, this is not me now reporting a view about the, the, the ancients. This is me interpreting some ancient. Mm. Um, I just don't think that the Stoics thought that the sage was a kind of an end point that was a kind of, um, a, kind of a theoretical posit and a kind of a North Star that we guide ourselves by but there was never anyone who was the sage. Mm. Um, now, there are folks who disagree with that. And so, uh, and, and there's good evidence in some literature to sh- that it seems that the Sto- that it does look like the Stoics did, were committed to there being some sages. In Seneca's works, uh, it looks like he seems to think that Socrates was one. Epictetus looks like he thinks that Socrates and maybe Diogenes the Cynic was one. There's some inconsistent evidence about whether or not they thought that Zeno himself was one. Uh, mm. Seneca uh, also looks like he th- he says that um, uh, 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 Cato uh, Eutychensis was one. Uh, and so there are moments in in the Stoic corpus where it looks like they talk about these folks like they're sages. Um, and so whenever I say the Stoics didn't think that they were sages, this is me saying. This is my interpretation is that whenever they do these things, these are rhetorical techniques for us to be able to look at them as sages, but they're not really saying they're sages. Mm. Um, and so the, they do the same thing with Heracles. They do it with Odysseus on occasion. Um, but I'm not inclined to think that any of those cases where they set those folks up as people who are examples of wisdom, uh, that what we're doing is we're looking at things that they did as exemplary, not them themselves as exemplary of wisdom of, of yeah. being sages. So in this regard, and this is maybe even another way to sort of break the paradox that we had at the beginning, is that whenever the, whenever Seneca says the, the, the sapiens, the, the wise person, the person who's the, become the sage, um, 
uh, surpasses God, he's not talking about any actual human being and any actual human being, any human being that would ever become actual. We're just not the kind of things that can do that. Um, we are co kind of constantly in this sort of halfway house between those who haven't made that kind of progress and those and the kind of progress that we have been doing our best to make and mm. others, right? Yeah. Uh, and us. And the sage is way out there. And then, you know, in, in Greek, they call them the idiotes. That just means the folks that don't know any, that don't know any better. Um, mm. And so you've got the sage, you've got plenty of idiotes, and then you've kind of got us. And we're kind of in the middle. You know, we've been idiotes. We're still a little bit idiotes. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use that we, as an insult from now on, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that. Uh, right. So, uh, right. So that it's Greek, right? So it's, you get to, you get to, you get to say, yeah, it's just a Greek, it's a Greek term. It's not, I'm not calling you an idiot. That's just where that term came from. I know I'll make it clear, but <laughs> yeah, but I, and I, I, yeah. let me pause for a second and say two mm. quick things about, about this whole mm. setup. One, anyone who's grew up in a Christian environment is already familiar with these three categories. We've got sinners. We've got Jesus, who was a man and also a God. Mm. And then there's everybody else who's doing their best. It's like, look, I'm, I know what sin is. I know the good news, but I need help, right? And I'm on my way and I'm doing my best and I'm a progressor. And in this regard, Stoicism was sort of ripe for the picking from uh, early Christian theologians. Uh, second thing is that this theme of you might say aspirational theorizing where you hold an ideal out and you say this is an ideal this is something that's never going to be actual but it's something that's imminent in the actual it's just something that we just don't have any expectation of it ever being something that we can achieve um, we hold that out and then we say look this is an this is this is a thing that we strive for this is an ideal that we strive for and we become better even in our failing uh, mm. and that's a theme that's was was all over Hellenistic philosophy. Something that they inherited from Plato. And Plato's an idealist. He held these ideals and he thought that, now he thought that you could actually instantiate them and you could have these moments. Um, but they inherited that thought that it's like, look, we can hold the ideal out. We don't think that they're re those ideals are ever real. And we don't think that there's another place that they exist. But we think that, that we can manifest them in mind, manifest them in thought. And they can direct us. And so the Stoics, whenever the Stoic, when the Stoics talk about the sage, that's that idealism pulling them in a, in a direction. The same yeah. thing happens with the skeptics. When the skeptics talk about the skeptic, they're talking about an ideal. When the Epicureans, the Epicureans are a little bit different. The Epicureans thought that there was one person who manifested everything perfectly, and that was Epicurus. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and he got it all right. Yeah. But but everybody else follows that ideal. So they're they're a little bit different in that regard. They think that Epicurus got it all right. We're kind of living in his shadow. Um, but that that aspirate that you might call it the Hellenistic aspirationalist story. They all thought that the things that we were aspiring for were different, but they all shared the same story. There were there was folks who hadn't heard the good news. There was the ideal that the good news put you on the way to, and then there's all the rest of us doing our best to kind of fix ourselves mm. and make our way on that road. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of an important point in human history where we really start to really specifically develop this notion of we are aiming creatures and we need some sort of perfect being to aim ourselves or to measure ourselves against. And that that is actually such a valuable psychological technique to, to say, I want to be like that person and there's no, and, and then you look at the Bible and you think, okay, well, what they've created here, or what, what has been, uh, you know, documented here is a being so perfect that nobody can attain it. So you give yourself the grace to be like, okay, well, I'm not going to be that. So when I do mess up, that's okay. Which is psychologically such a perfect technique because the last thing you want to get is bogged down in all of your faults because you're going to have them. Right. But then, right. Hey, still follow this guy, still try to become like this guy, still try to, to be everything that you can be. And it seems like that's what the sage was to the Stoics, right? Like try to become it, 
but recognize that you'll never be there. So it's okay when you mess up, but still it's no excuse to not try to reach that level. That's right. And I mean, in some ways, the, the sort of the, the, the intellectual jump that is made by Christianity that mm. in some ways is brilliant mm. is one to say that there was somebody who instantiated all the sort of perfections to acknowledge that that's something that's beyond the reach of humans. So he has to be a little bit, little bit man, a little bit God, how exactly that happens. Pun. Um, but the second part of it is that, the crucial thing is that with all the other Hel with all the other Hellenistic philosophical programs, Stoicism, Epicureanism, skepticism, all of them were ones that said, okay, look, we're going to give you the tools for you to be able to make your own progress and you're going to fail. Everyone does, but you can make the progress and you can make a lot of progress on your own. Mm. And whenever you fail, it's your, it's your fault, right? It, it's inevitable, but in some ways it's still, it would still be your fault. Uh, but all of the tools for your correction are still within you. The difference that Christianity makes is one that the, that the, that the ideal is a sort of a God human known. The second one is this notion of grace that the divine helps you in a way that closes that gap that you, that in some ways we're fallen creatures. It has to do with other sorts of theological stories, but we're fallen creatures. We're imperfect things. And that the only way that we can actually make the real progress, is with the help of a God. Uh, mm. And that's something that, again, Epicureans weren't committed to anything like that. Because they thought that the gods pretty much ignored us. Skeptics didn't have a view about whether or not the gods helped us. They didn't even have really a view about whether or not there were gods. The Stoics thought that the gods in some ways helped us, but the gods just helped us by in some ways just being the same kind of thing as us mm. and living those sort of perfect lives. They don't help us in that regard, but in some ways the the sort of the brilliance of the sort of the christian response was supposed to in some ways mediate that to kind of take it out of our hands um uh and in, now again i think that as you rightly said which is that in some ways it then lets us off the hook in some ways mm. for our failings uh, yeah. uh that's uh that's an unfortunate thing uh but on the other hand it, there's a kind of um there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a nice way that it's supposed to be something like, look, in, in some ways what you're doing is you're making peace with the divine. Uh, mm. And then in making peace with the divine, that itself is going to be something that sort of puts you further along. Um, yeah. So anyhow, there's a sort of a good deal of parallels between, between these traditions. Um, the Christians in some ways did a really nice job of taking, some, taking an insight from Stoicism uh, and then integrating it into their theological program. Mm. Yeah, and... You know, I, I think that what is so cool to look at and, and this all relates to what you just said is over history, you've seen that these different schools of, of philosophy in Greece and Rome um, mixed with the religions that came out of that time and that place as well, uh, they've kind of grown and in many ways been perverted. And, and, and now we see the exact same sort of groups in our Western culture now, I mean, you've got the extreme atheists over here and they're kind of like the skeptics, you know, <laughs> and then you've got, um, you know, the hedonists over here who have just perverted Epicureanism and, and they're just like, Hey, I'm just riding this baby all the way to death, you know? And, and then you've got, um, obviously you've got the Christians and then you, you, what, what I think is so beautiful is, um, you have stoicism, which can kind of play in all of these different realms it can go anywhere. You know, it's, it's, it's really like, it's, it's such a beautiful philosophy because there's so many different avenues you can take it down. But what I think is so, um, so something that I got from your article, which was really interesting to me, and I think it really applies to today is this idea of ha having your value theory. What's the base that you're, you've got your arguments on? What do you value? And this is something that we don't talk about enough today because you really, it's so hard to have a debate with anyone, a conversation with anyone about anything today without first saying, okay, what, what's important to you? Are you going after virtue or is money important to you? Are you going after virtue or is fame important to you? Cause we can't have this conversation unless I know what your value is, where you hold that. Uh, do, do you think that that's a fair assessment of where we are today and, and how important it is, is it for people to define exactly what their value base is? Yeah, I think that it's, I think that 
one, it's a, it's a, it, it's, it's not unique to today. I mm. think, um, I think that it's exacerbated by the fact that we communicate a lot, but you're, but, but you're sure. bad at it. Uh, and so uh, it's magnified because our, our capacity to have our communications go badly uh, is, uh, is as, as, as great as our capacity to communicate. And yeah. it turns out that just we've got, we've got a lot of platforms uh, and a lot of ways to, 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 to muck up our communications. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the value of clarity is something that I think that everyone is committed to um, in theory. But um, ironically enough, whenever we start discussing things, uh, it seems to sort of go out the go out the door. A very, a very easy example is just the way that um, the discussions about the coronavirus lockdown have gone, mm. uh, at least in the United States. Um, there, it's unclear what uh, it's clear on one hand why we did the lockdown. It's unclear what it is the hurry to return to normal is driven by. Sometimes the argument is that we shouldn't just be living our lives <laughs> beholden to fear that we're going to get sick or that we're going to make somebody else sick. It's unclear what that means. Um, Sometimes they're purely economic arguments. Sometimes they're economic. Sometimes they're arguments just about sort of the value of normal and the value of connection with other people. Um, but what is so regularly the case is that we're is that everyone seems to realize that we're that there that we have these dangers and these dangers are not just ones that you yourself ex are exposed to that you expose others to, and so just in terms of just being able to have that sort of grown up conversation, say, okay, look, let's put all the values that, we've, that we're talking about on the table. We can even concede that they're valuable. Um, so, but now we need to be able to sort of have some clarity as to what exactly we're doing here. Um, mm. Now, again, I think that lots of folks can have that conversation. It's not hard to be able to talk about what that conversation would look like. So in some ways it's up to us, right? Yeah. But that's the problem. Once you put it this way, you're like, oh, it's not actually that hard to actually have that conversation to be able to sort of work things out, be able to see things clearly. But do we do it? No. And that, and that's, and in some ways, that's the sort of, the sort of the giant disappointment of, um, the consistent disappointment of political, of a lot of our political argumentation is that it's actually, that to be able to state the stakes clearly and to be able to have the conversation, to be able to hear each other is not something that's actually very difficult to do. Human beings are, have got that capacity and mm. it's not a hard one, but nevertheless, Con to be able to do it consistently, it turns out is very difficult. It's kind of like spelling or like yeah. writing, writing, a, writing a sentence that doesn't have a grammatical error or something like that. It was like, well, I, you know, you, you can do that, right? The, doing it consistently, it turns out is really hard. Otherwise we wouldn't need proofreaders, but mm. nevertheless, it's something that's in your power. We just focus, focus and do it and go back and fix errors. Yeah. I, you know, I would love to see somebody come out and say, okay, you know what? Yeah. Individual freedom. That's important. We'll put that. That's a value. Uh, okay. Life. Okay. We want to save as many people as possible. Now, how do we save as many people with pos as possible uh, without also valuing, also valuing, you know, like, uh, okay, over here you've got, um, okay, well you have to work. That's a good thing. You know, you, you've got to have a job. That's beautiful. Um, okay. Business is being ruined or, you know, that there's so many different, layers that we could talk about but we don't talk about them and i think yeah. that that i think that with the internet and media and everything i think it comes down to we don't necessarily care to talk about them because we're so interested in the debate and i'm like that too i love a good debate you know i'll, I'll click on the spammy video on Drama's youtube yeah <laughs> you know drama's good man <laughs> but um one thing I wanted to jump into with you is is this idea of uh, the inner citadel because I don't think I've ever really gone into depth with anybody on the podcast about this. Where did it come from? What is it, um, and and how can it help? Yeah. So uh, right. So the the inner citadel is a uh, it's an image that's made famous in Marcus Aurelius's uh, meditations, um, and so maybe in some ways the best way to to kind of get it out is to return to the stoic value theory. Um, and kind of a thought could just be this little thought experiment that you could kind of do with yourself, which is just think of someone that you admired. 
think of someone that you admire or admired in the past. Um, and one of the things that I that I that seems to pop up for me is that um, what I admired about them was a stable character trait that they would have been able to exhibit. So um, I admired my dissertation advisor for his honesty and his frankness uh, and his, even his willingness to change his mind. Uh, I admired my father uh, for his devotion and for his hard work. Um, I admire my wife uh, for her capacity and her patience uh, and her intelligence. Those are all character traits that it looks like they're relatively stable. Um, and whenever we think about that, we're just like, well, you know, it turns out that that good thing about you, about these people, are ones that are often exposed and shown under conditions that are challenges to them. In some ways, the way that you see the, the thing that you admire in the other person is whenever it's shown against a kind of a wave, you might say, the, the way, only way to see the rocks or to be noticed the rocks under the river is for the river to be rippling and things like that. Mm. And so the crucial thing about all of these virtues and the things that we admire about the folks is that they're revealed whenever they're challenged. And, they're and they can still stick around even whenever other things aren't the case, right? So these people could still be on, you can still be honest if you don't have money or if you're not good looking or if you don't have status. You can still be caring and you can still be, you can still be dutiful even if you are divested of uh, so many of the sort of the good pleasures that we, that we become att attracted to. And so, the goodness and the admirability of someone's life in enacting those virtues is something that looks like is a lot more stable than the other things around them. Mm. So the inner citadel, the inner citadel then is going to be in some ways like a kind of a fortress, right? Uh, uh, and maybe fortress is too strong because it's still going to be in some ways like a kiwi tox. It's going to be, a, it's going to be something that we, that we can live inside of and that, the good things can stay alive in there, even if other things outside of it are ravaged. So what the image of the inner citadel ultimately is, is a kind of bulwark against a good deal of fate's vicissitudes. And it's one that we build in anticipation of fate in anticipation of the fact that the world is a grist mill. Hmm. And so developing these skills of being able to manage that and maintain your equanimity in the face of that um, is something that is admirable. And it's admirable in a stable way that be admiring someone for their wealth or admiring someone for their looks or admiring someone for their status um, isn't stable. Um, in fact, what regularly is the case is that whenever you challenge, so you, um, think about the two things, right? You have a challenge to someone's honesty. And if they're honest, the virtue and the thing that you admire in them shines through a challenge to someone's wealth regularly reveals them not to be quite as admirable. Mm. Uh, the wealth goes away. And what regularly we see is that folks become jealous and uh, impatient. Um, and so think of so many times. I mean, you think of just uh, so many of these instances where people who value the externals, whenever the external inevitably becomes uh, something that is, um, challenged, but can be taken away, uh, they cling to it in ways that are uh, insane. <laughs> uh, at the very least, in ways that are inappropriate, in ways that reveal them to not be admirable people. Um, mm. And so, I mean, it's 
you can think of so many so many instances um, and they're accessible in terms of the ways that we tell our fairy tales uh, the, the what is it the, the the snow white story the the thing that drives the snow white story is the fact that the mother is beautiful you know like I admire her for her beauty but she's got to be the fairest of them all and she's mm. willing to make make anyone who's in even remotely fairer than her uh, eat a poison apple or what have you um, and nobody ever says man I you know I just don't understand the motivation of this of this evil stepmother inaccessible to me it's like yeah i totally understand what that what that yeah. what it is to be somebody who's yeah if you value if you value being fair the fairest of them all uh i'd see exactly what that does to you um mm. and the same thing goes with with especially gosh status is exactly that kind of grist mill um being at the top of the heap turns one into a very um snappy person yeah no that, that that's a really good kind of explanation of what that is it, and, it, and it makes a lot of sense to me as well talking about as, as a as a fortress just because man i was watching uh w there's this new show on netflix i don't know if it's new anyway i saw a couple of episodes it's tell about, me more it's tell me <laughs> tell me about good shows i gotta I'm, I, as it turns out i'm locked up in my house i gotta find good shows yeah <laughs> it's it's called the last kingdom it's it's about early britain right and so you look at these people back then and man, they had their little fortress city in the middle of nature, which is just absolute chaos, constantly trying to kill them. And then you've got all kinds of groups of people coming in there trying to kill them. And it's like, man, you had to build a strong fortress around your tiny little slither of culture that could protect what you were trying to do, which was trying to be virtuous, have a place for your people, safety, you know, and, and you had to really protect yourself from nature and other people because they were going to just crush you if you didn't. And I think that what's so beautiful about this analogy is taking it and saying, it's exactly the same in your mind. You have to protect yourself from outside influences that could lead you down a road that would be counterproductive for yourself. And so it's just, it just keeps on getting smaller and smaller, right? And it's kind of goes down to even what, what Epictetus talks about with the dichotomy of control. It's like, what do you control? Oh man, what's the smallest inner citadel that I actually have? It's, yeah. it's such a deep idea. I, it's, it's, it's really, it's very compelling. Um, mm. It's inspiring. Um, and, but one of the things that I think that whenever you read the first chapter of Marcus Aurelius's meditations, it's something that, I think that every Stoic needs to come to terms with. Anyone who aspires to be a Stoic, or anyone who even wants to understand Stoicism, needs to come to terms with. Uh, which is that, in some ways, what the inner citadel does is it makes you immune to fortune. Mm. That's great. And so you, you're, you in some ways have a kind of a, it's not permanent, you'll die. <laughs> the citadel is gonna, citadel's gonna fall. But, it's a it's a it's a temporary refuge from the ravages of fortune outside the walls hmm. but you have to have built it so on analogy with the the last kingdom account they needed to not have barbarians coming down on them all the time and they needed to have the resources and they needed to have just enough people to get together to be able to like can we stock we stack some rocks up <laughs> for the next time they come right you need to have you need to have an architect. You need to have some. You need you need to have enough grain to be able to get you through the time whenever you're stacking the rocks up, right? Thing, the, and so here's the great irony, right? Whenever you read the first chapter of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, the way to see that is Marcus thanking fate for allowing him the capacities to make himself immune to fate. That's mm. a big thought. Marcus had to have the right teachers. He had to be exposed to philosophy early, or else he would have become Caesarified. Mm. He needed to be lucky enough to not be around the people who beat their who beat their servants, so that he didn't develop that habit before he knew better. He needed to have the right kinds of tutors, so that he could be able to read the things that would actually change his mind. It turns out 
that that the first like I find the first chapter of the meditations in some ways a kind of a mind blowing ex exercise because the objective of stoicism is to make it so that luck doesn't affect your life but you have to be lucky to be able to put yourself into that position. Epictetus too is somebody who sees this problem. Epictetus was a slave. Marcus was an emperor. And a regular canard of Stoicism is that it's a, it's a philosophy for everybody. We've got the philosopher emperor and we've got the philosopher slave. And so it's a philosophy that anyone can exercise. And that's true in a, to a degree, but what it does is it dials down how lucky Epictetus was from the Stoic perspective. At least. He's un, we don't want to downplay the fact that he was unlucky because he was a slave. That, mm. that, that is not a, uh, an enviable position for anybody. But the thing that Epictetus got whenever he was bought by Epaphroditus and was brought to Rome to be a, 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 a slave to, to, to uh, a, a secretary for Nero, is that he had to be trained to write, to read. If he was going to be answering letters, which, are, which the slave to the secretary did, he needed to be able to sort of do some rhetoric and he needed to be able to write in, in compelling fashion. And that's the reason why he ended up being educated by Musonius Rufus. In order for him to be the Stoic that he was, he had to not just be a slave, cracking rocks or something like that. For Epictetus to be Epictetus, he had to have effectively the, a, an education that approximated what Marcus got. Hmm. And so the, one of the ironies of Epictetus' life is that, yes, he was a slave. And in many ways, his philosophy displays how that one can be the philosopher Epictetus was under those conditions. But it still required some training. It still required a kind of exercise of mind to be able to have that control and to consistently exercise that control. And in some ways, that's a frustrating thing as a Stoic. As somebody who admires the Stoics and is a Stoic practitioner, one of the things that's appealing to, Stoic, as to, Sto, uh, to Stoicism that makes it different from Epicureanism, that makes it different from Aristotelianism, is that it looks like the objective here is to sort of make it so all the goods are ones that, that you don't have to defend, depend on fate to have. Hmm. But to have that perspective, it actually it requires, and to consistently be able to exercise that perspective, it actually requires that fate have been collaborating with you. Yeah. You have to have gotten lucky to have had, maybe to be the philosopher that Epictetus was required all this training, but at the very least required that you have had a good example around you and someone that, that you admired, that admired those stable traits and that you saw that instead of people that you didn't. Um, think of the difficulty that someone would have if they didn't have those opportunities. Um, it, Stoicism is still, you might say, within their grasp, but it's not as quite as it's not quite the easy grasp that Epictetus would have had. Mm. And so, a great irony about Stoicism, and it's one that I think that every Stoic practitioner has to, in some ways, be aware of. Um, this is the reason why, by the way, Simon, I, it's one of the reasons why I admire the work that you do, is that Stoicism is an outreach program. Stoicism is something that said, well, look, you don't need a ton of training to be able to be a Stoic. You need still Stoic training. Mm. You have to be lucky. But in this case, whatever platform we're, we're going to be using, YouTube or anything like that, it's going to be a lot more accessible than you might say being able to make it to Musonius Rufus's lectures in Rome. Yeah. Uh, and even the same thing about the Enlightenment. I mean, like, look, I mean, to be able to be exposed to Stoicism you know, 400, 500 years ago, you need to know, need to know Greek and Latin. To be able to be exposed to Stoicism 50 years ago, you need to be able to have a tolerance for people who read Greek and Latin. <laughs> um, but, but now it's something that's, you might say, considerably more democratized. In some ways, that's a benefit. And that, not just some ways, in many ways, lots of ways. Mm. Um, that's one of the benefits. 
But it's nevertheless something that I think that every practitioner of Stoicism needs to acknowledge and needs to mm. sort of make peace with, which is that, yes, Stoicism is a program that makes you immune to fate. But fate, in some ways, had to make it so that you became immune to fate. Yeah. And I would turn that around and say, once you've recognized that you had to have luck in order to be, like if you're listening to this podcast and you're getting some value out of Stoicism, man, so I'm not like, I'm not like tooting my own horn about this podcast, but the fact that you are on this path that is leading you to a better character, to be a better person, man, you got to cherish this because I've talked about this with Roderick Yap. He's this uh, military, ex-military guy in, uh, in London. But, um, you know, we talk about so many people are still born into conditions where it's just fight or flight every single day. They don't have time to think about this. If you have time to sit down and listen to a conversation about stoicism, man, like you're so lucky, so fortunate. Fortune has smiled upon you. Like don't waste this opportunity to like Epictetus says, like, just don't waste this. How long are you going to, how long are you going to sit here, you know, waiting to be free? Try to do it. Try to free yourself from the things that are enslaving you and, and become the person you can be. I, I love that. I think that's a good place to, you know, end the conversation, but let it be known, Scott, that uh, it, it doesn't go without being noticed that how lucky I am to have a conversation like this with you. I'm so grateful and I want to have you back as many times as possible. Simon, uh, I feel lucky to have gotten to have the conversation with you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for email updates, join my Patreon meetup groups that we hold weekly, or if you'd like to offer feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics on the show, then you can head to simonjedrew.com. There you'll also find information about how we can work one-on-one together with my alignment coaching based around the philosophical principles found in Stoicism. Finally, if you are on Facebook, then I'd love to see you in our group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But hey, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll talk to you next time.